Pre-Calc, chapter 3, section 1. So this chapter is about exponent and logarithmic functions. And so let's review some rules. And so we've talked about some of these in the past. And so we've talked about some of these in the past, but these are ones we have to be familiar with. You need to be able to use these to be able to manipulate and change our expression. And so exponent function, uh, if you're given like f of x equals a to the x power, is when your x is the exponent. That makes an exponential function. You can approximate if I have f of x equals 8 to the x for f of pi. You can write that as 8 to the pi power. I just want to talk about how to punch this in the calculator. So the 8 on the calculator, the caret key, and then you hit the pi key and then you hit equal to approximate that value. And I can give you that value to be 687.29. So it's approximate to the nearest number for 8 to the 1 half power. So we should be able to manipulate this. So there, here's our exponent that is a fraction. So this is really meaning the square root of 8 to the first power, which is the same thing as 2 root 2. And so you should be able to manipulate that. So you don't have to plug this in the calculator. So uh, for graphing, f of x equals 2 to the negative x. We can manipulate this again. So this would be like 1 over 2 to the x. Now, there's not an x exponent here for the 1. But 1 to any power is going to be 1. So I can rewrite this as 1 half to the x power. That's kind of a, this is where it becomes hard to be able to manipulate expressions using exponent rules to help us better understand what's happening in the problem. So 2 to the negative x, you might have a hard time understanding that, or you have, to, you have 1 half to the x, it's a better way of writing for most students. Where if you realize that the base of this exponent is our growth factor, so that tells me already that it's, it's decaying by half, or 50%. And so if I plug in this negative 2 value, actually if I plug in 0 first, my 0 for that is going to be 1. So then at 1, I'm going to be half of that. 2 is going to be 1 fourth. So I can use patterns really quick to get my, my, uh, my values here, my billing table. If you want to plug in a number for negative 1 and calculate that, you could do that. But I know it's 2. I know this is going to be 4. I'm just using my growth factor to help me write all these values. So here's our sketch bar graph. So here's our sketch bar graph. If you haven't noticed, it's going to approach this. We never touch it. That's why this fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But it's never going to actually reach 0. So there's actually a horizontal asymptote, which then start to helps us talk about domain and range. For this graph, there is a domain. Our domain, our x value is, which is this is all the numbers. We're going left and right forever. It's slightly going left, but not much. And we do go right. And then our range, so our y values, we can't go below uh, y equals 0. And then it actually will not be y equals 0. So it's got to have values that are... And I can, it can, you can say y has to be greater than or equal to, not equal to, just greater than 0. Or you can write that as an interval notation. So we're saying cannot be 0 all the way to positive infinity. So you can also write it as an integral notation. So we'll be able to describe our domain and range for these functions as well. Uh, to recall from basic math here, our base value, if your base is between 0 and 1, it's decay, and that's what's happening here. Then if our base is greater than um, 1, it's going to be a growth. And we usually talk about the absolute value. The negative does something different, which is the transformation, so which we'll talk about in a second. I do want you to notice here how this negative here is applied to the x. It's in the exponent. So what happened to our parent function? Our parent function of this graph would actually be this function right here, this graph. So what happened to go from this graph to our second graph? It was actually a horizontal reflection, reflection over the y-axis. So our transformations that apply for this, given our uh, parent function, um, a to the x, what happens when we apply it here? So again, our a value is still our growth factor. It tells us if we're growing or decaying and uh, how much we are growing or decaying by. The other ones here, the plus or minus, is our vertical reflection. B value here is outside of the exponent, so it's applying to the function, the parent function, so it's actually the vertical shift, so it's saying going up or down. And then the C value here is applying to the x before you take the power, so this would actually be the horizontal shift. 
And so those are the different kinds of transformations we talked about in the past. So in this first example, we have 4 as our base, so that's what we're growing by. So we actually have a growth. That's x minus 2, so this is telling me I'm going to go 2 right. It takes the parent function and interests it 2 right. And then this 4 value tells me my growth factor. So I know I'm starting at that 4 value. And then the next one here, we still have a growth factor of 4. So um, our starting value would be 4. We are going to shift it up 3 as well. This is outside our function, so we're going to go up 3. Then our negative x, it's a negative x, not a negative 4, a negative x. So this would be a y-axis reflection, which means reflection left to right. So we should be able to look at our transformations before we even start graphing and understanding what's happening. Uh, one to one, I call that the one to one exponent property. That's what I typically call that. This helps us graph um, or helps us solve the function. So 16 equals 4 to the x plus 1. We can solve it for x. Now, a lot of these are more complicated than this, but if we can write 16 with the same base as 4. So 16 I know is 4 squared. Then I can write it equal to the 4 to the x plus 1. So again, manipulating our numbers using our exponent rules. So these both have the same base. The only way of these two things are going to be equivalent is if their powers are equivalent. And that's, Lucy, don't pay the lights. And that's called the exponent property of 1 to 1. Um, exponent property 1 to 1. So if you're looking at your proofs from geometry, kind of explaining how you're getting that, that's what you could put. And so then we can just solve that. So then x would equal 1, subtract 1 to both sides. That helps us solve our functions. The natural exponential function, so f of x equals e to the x, which is used a lot in life, where e is the natural base, uh, 2.718, this, this number. Where does it come from? Well, it's, first of all, it's kind of considered similar to pi, the value of this. As x approaches, as x approaches infinity for this expression, so this expression right here, which we're going to see the same kind of term or same kind of setup here in a second when we deal with our money, um, but as this x value becomes larger and larger and larger, the number gets closer and closer to e. So as, as you plug infinity in, we cannot put infinity in here, but as we get closer and closer to infinity, the number gets closer and closer to e. So we say this value is equivalent to e then. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the chapter 11. Um, this is where it comes from. And so e to the x, that value, which is u, so if you want to find 6.2 for e to the x, there's a key in your calculator. Hopefully you can try to find that e to the 6.2. And if you evaluate that, just to test to see if you can plug that in correctly, 492.7490, uh, if you round that. So that would be the value. Uh, you would get so some other types of applications, radioactive decay, uh, for example, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. If there is 10 pounds in 1955, how much is there in 1985? So let me see if you can figure out a question. So remind me tomorrow to answer that question for you. So if we're going to answer this question, f of x equals b times g of x. This is how I've always grown up uh, writing exponential functions where um, b is my starting value, and then g to the x, g is my growth factor, and then uh, x is my exponent. You may prefer it written like this, uh, b plus or minus a times g to the x. Maybe another way of writing that, so you can see what's happening, or you can do x minus c. If you want to see the transformations. With um, that awesome a value, you can now see it. it's actually the number in front of our base, which is different than what we were talking on the previous slides, but it doesn't matter the variable you use, it matters where it's at in the expression. So, plutonium. So we have a starting value. Whenever I'm dealing with exponent functions, I always try to find the start. What's our starting value? Our starting value um, we had was 10 pounds. 10 pounds in 1955. Uh, and we know that there's a half-life uh, every 24,000 years. Now I want to know the question is in 85, uh, how much would it be? So that's it. That's 30 years. So 30 years have gone by. So when I write our function, and I'll tell you the actual radioactive half-life formula, but 
I wanted to show you how I, how I usually build this. I always put my starting value. So our starting value, 10 pounds, is always this number in front, our starting value. Times our growth factor. Our growth factor for this problem is a half because it's half life. Um, that's what half life means. It means every so many, so much time, so many years, for us it's 24,000 years in this for this uh, for plutonium for 24,000 years we get half of what we had to begin with so after 24,000 years we'll go from 10, 10 pounds to 5 pounds so then the exponent here is always the time and so the time that's gone by of the half-life so 30 years have gone by out of the 24,000 years it takes to create a half-life so this fraction is a ratio of how much of the half-life has occurred. Uh, and so this is what the formula would be to figure out the amount of plutonium uh, from 55 to 85. Uh, and so if you plug this in your calculator, make sure you actually have your exponent in parentheses. And so you have to do one half to the power first. Use your exponent rules. So you evaluate this and then multiply it by 10. If you do that, you get 9.913 pounds in 30 years. So that's how much you would actually have. Uh, and so the function I think of when I see b times g to the x, I think of this as my starting amount. This is my growth when growing by or decaying by. And then this is my time. That's how I always think about exponent rules. And all the functions are kind of the same setup. They may have different expressions. So like radioactive decay is always going to be like your starting amount, I'll call it P, times one half to the uh, years that have gone by over the half-life years. So last, last kind of example is our money compound interest, which when we're using compound interest, these are the variables we tend to use, and these are what they mean. A is the amount of money at time t, so that's how much money you have. P is the principal, which is the starting amount of money. Uh, I actually is, uh, R is the interest rate, written as a percent. N is the number of times interest is taken per year. And then T is the amount of years, or the time. So if 4,000 is invested with 5.25% interest compound monthly, how much would you have after six years? So again, our starting amount, 4,000, is our P times 1 plus our interest rate, which as a decimal, so be careful doing that, 0 0.0525 over N. Now, how many times would this be compound in a year? So it's compound monthly. So that word compound, you need to look for that. If it has the word compound, what comes after it or before it um, will tell you what the N value is. So monthly would be 12 times in a year. So I put 12, all raised to the 12 times however many years have gone by, so six. So again, this top number tells you how many times that this base is going to occur. So it's six years, 12 times per year, so this would be 36 times that we've taken this interest. So that's what this exponent means. So again, this is just now computation. Can you plug this in your calculator correctly? Again, be careful how you plug this in. Make sure you file your order operations using parentheses. If you do that, you get an amount that's approximate to $5,477.27. And so that value there um, will be approximate for after six years. Now, what if I said compound continuously? And so the difference here is we're going to let that n value continuously it means n will go to infinity. It's infinitely compounded, so an infinite times in a year. So then our base of this, this formula, 1 plus r, would be going over infinity to the infinity times t, which is the infinity. So this is kind of the actual formula. And so instead of using that, we can do it what we call pert. Um, so it's p times e to the rt power. And so pert, pert, is what we use when we do compound continuously. So the wording is very important in these problems. Compound continuously or compound quarterly or monthly tells you which formula and what to plug in. So for this one, you're going to use the same information, but plug it into this formula PERT, and then try evaluating. So this is your homework, homework problem, homework video problem.
to try evaluating what if those compound continues. So I'll call it good for 3-1. I'll see you tomorrow.